welcome back to my channel. It is Eponine, aka Epi, and today I am coming at you with yet another true crime video. Today's video is going to be on the story of Nicholas Markowitz, who was a young boy who was killed in the year 2000. Now, if you've seen the movie Alpha Dog that came out a couple years ago, you may be familiar with this story. That movie was loosely based off of the story of Nicholas. Um, he was known as Zach Mazursky in that film and it is dramatized a little bit, but it is based off of his story. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the story of Nicholas Markowitz. So Nicholas was born in Los Angeles, California in 1984 to Jeff and Susan Markowitz. They were both very dedicated and devoted parents, they both just wanted what was best for their kid, and they both had his best interests at heart all of the time. Now, Nicholas had two older siblings. He had a half-sister, and he also had a half-brother, and his half-brother's name was Benjamin. Now, Benjamin was not really a good influence to Nicholas. He was involved in drugs. He was involved in partying. He was involved in drinking. He broke the law a lot and that had created a lot of tension between him and his parents. And Susan Markowitz was quoted as saying she worked double time to keep Nicholas out of trouble because they did not want him following in the same footsteps as his older brother. Benjamin, because of his drug involvements, was acquaintances with somebody known as Jesse James Hollywood. And yes, that was his real legal name. And he was a drug dealer in the California area. His dad's name was Jack Hollywood, and he was the one who provided a lot of drugs to his son. He was also caught up in drug activity and was kind of just known as a lowlife and a loser at that point in time. On the night of August 5th, 2000, Nicholas Markowitz had been hanging out with his brother and he returned home and had gotten in a fight with his parents. He was intoxicated, he was being disrespectful, he was being rude, and to his parents, he was just acting a little bit too much like Ben for their comfort. So they ended up getting in a bit of a disagreement that night. And because of that, the next morning, super early, Nicholas actually ran away from home and just left because he didn't really want to deal with all of the issues he knew he was going to have because of his behavior the night before. So while he was walking down the street, Jesse James Hollywood and his friends, Jesse Ruggie and William Skidmore, all noticed Nicholas walking down the street. Now, this is when they decided to come up with a really, really evil plan. You see, Benjamin had owed Jesse Hollywood money, and that was just for drug stuff. In the movie Alpha Dog, the monetary amount was reflected at about $1,200, but in real life it's estimated to have been a little bit closer to $3,600. So while they were walking down the street and they saw Nicholas, they decided, we're going to kidnap him, and that's how we're going to get our money back from Benjamin. So at this point, they pulled over, they chased, they assaulted, and they abducted Nicholas Markowitz, and they put him in their vehicle. So after the kidnapping, Hollywood and his friends took Nicholas and they drove to pick up another one of their friends named Brian Affronti. At this point, they drove to Santa Barbara, California, where they had informed Nicholas why they had kidnapped him. And at this point, obviously, he was really afraid. This was not anything he was involved in. He was not caught up in the drug game. So he was really, really scared. He was really nervous and he didn't know what was going to happen to him. So to kind of help calm his nerves a little bit, his kidnappers actually started offering him drugs. So they started giving him drugs like Valium and marijuana. They started letting him drink alcohol and it kind of just helped ease the tension a little bit, as weird as that sounds, because yes, this group did kidnap Nicholas, but it's not like they regularly kidnapped people. They weren't in it for that. They were just in it for essentially money, and they figured this was their way to get that money. So instead of just tying him up and just treating him like a normal kidnapping victim, they actually kind of started treating him like one of the group. So at this point, Jesse James Hollywood left Jesse Ruggie in charge of Nicholas, and he drove back to Los Angeles to try to settle things with Benjamin and to let him know, hey, we have your brother, we need this money, and you'll get him back, and everything will be fine. It was reported that Ruggie told Markowitz that he was going to be fine over and over, that they were just going to get through this, and he was going to get him back home, and everything was going to be okay. So Ruggie was really helped putting Nicholas at ease. And it's reported that Ruggie and Nicholas kind of developed a little bit of a friendship, actually, and they genuinely got along pretty well with each other. 
Now, it's also reported by witnesses who are around the group of kidnappers at this point, as well as Nicholas, that a lot of people didn't even know that he was kidnapped. A lot of people didn't know that he didn't want to be there or that he wasn't supposed to be there just because of how comfortable he was with the group and how at ease he really seemed to be acting. And Nicholas's own family at this point really didn't even know that he was missing. They assumed that he had ran away, but they thought that he was probably just with some friends and that he would be home soon and that he just ran away because of the fight. They had no idea that he had actually been kidnapped. However, after he wasn't returning any of their pages or phone calls, they started to get a little bit nervous and they noticed that something might be wrong here and that maybe Nicholas isn't just with a friend. It didn't take long for his family to start worrying and after a while Susan had actually created almost a spreadsheet of all of the people that Nicholas knew, all of the places that he could have been, and she started frantically getting a hold of everybody that she could to try to track down her son. After 36 hours of them not knowing where Nicholas was, they managed to get a hold of Benjamin, and Ben reported that he wasn't with Nicholas and he didn't know where he was either. So at this point, they decided to call the police and the police got involved in the investigation. After the initial kidnapping, Nicholas was introduced to some other people in the kind of group of party goers that he was with and their names were Graham Presley, Natasha Adams Young, and Kelly Carpenter. Now this group of people kind of started bouncing around from house to house, just going to different house parties, the whole time taking Nicholas with them. And some people at this point had found out that he was kidnapped, yet none of them thought to call the police because he really seemed to be enjoying himself. There were reports of Nicholas playing video games on the couch, there were reports of him being tied up and having people help him smoke weed out of a bong, and he just seemed to be having a good time, so they didn't really think that it was a threatening enough situation to get the law involved. And it's reported that as many as 32 people actually knew that Nicholas Markowitz had been kidnapped, and they chose not to say anything or to do anything about it. And that's where everybody made a really, really big mistake. Because at this point, Jesse James Hollywood had actually talked to his father's lawyer and had found out just how much trouble he could get into for this crime. He had assaulted somebody, he had kidnapped them, he was holding them against their will, he was essentially demanding money to get them back, and he was breaking a lot of really serious laws. This was no longer, you know, nickel and dime bags of weed, this was felony kidnap charges, and this was a really, really big deal. So at this point, Jesse James Hollywood started to get really, really nervous, and his great plan to get out of all of this trouble was just to kill Nicholas. So back in Santa Barbara, all of the people decided to kind of throw Nicholas a little going away pool party type of thing before he actually went back to Los Angeles. And this party was held at the Lemon Tree Inn, which was a hotel. At this point, Nicholas assumed he would be fine, he thought this whole ordeal was almost over, and he even told people at the party that someday he would tell his grandkids about the story about the day that he got kidnapped. So after this party, it was the time that Jesse James Hollywood decided that they needed to end Nicholas Markowitz's life. So Jesse James Hollywood got a hold of one of his friends, whose name was Ryan Hoyt. And Ryan Hoyt was called to do the deed because he also was indebted to Hollywood. He owed him money as well. So the deal was, since you owe me money, you're going to go kill this kid, and then we'll be square. And the debt owed was roughly $1,200, so it was not a whole lot of money for somebody's life. Now, Ryan Hoyt was given a Tech 9 semi-automatic weapon and was ordered to take Nicholas Markowitz up into the hills in California near the West Camino Cielo Road, just north of a town called Galetta, California. And they were ordered to take him to a really popular hiking trail named the Lizard's Mouth Trail. So after the party started to wrap up early in the morning, Hoyt, Ruggy, and Presley drove an unexpected Nicholas Markowitz out into the mountains. And at this point, he still had no idea what his fate was going to be, and he had no idea what this group had planned for him. Now, while Presley waited in the car, Ruggy and Hoyt took Markowitz further up the trail to kind of a more secluded location because obviously they didn't want to be where other people could see them if they were about to murder somebody. And they took him up to a shallow grave that had actually been dug earlier that night by Presley. At this point, Nicholas started to notice all of his surroundings. He started to put one and one together and he started to realize that things were not going as he thought they were going to go. And he started to get really, really panicked, and he started to act really panicked. So at this point, Ruggy found Nicholas's hands behind his back with duct tape, and then he put duct tape over his mouth so that he couldn't make any noise and so that nobody could hear him screaming for help. 
After this, Hoyt hit Nicholas Markowitz really hard on the back of the head with a shovel and knocked him into the shallow grave. And then Nicholas was shot nine times at point blank range by Jesse James Hollywood's Tech 9 semi-automatic. It was reported that Presley could hear these shots from the car, but he still could not bring himself to go look at anything because they genuinely felt bad for Nicholas and this was not something that any of them wanted to be doing, but they felt like they had no other choice. After Nicholas Markowitz was murdered, they covered up his body with some brush and some debris and kind of just tried to hide him as best as they could, and they just left him there on the hiking trail. And fortunately for Nicholas, his body was not undiscovered for very long because it was in a pretty obviously spottable location, and his body was discovered three days later on August 12th of 2000. Now, the capture of the men involved wasn't the quickest process, but I am very pleased to report that Nicholas Markowitz did get some justice at the end of all of this. There were many different court cases as a result of this crime, and many different people who faced charges, such as Ryan Hoyt, who was 21 at the time of the murder. He was the one who actually shot Nicholas Markowitz and he was charged and sentenced to first-degree murder. Ryan Hoyt was actually given the death penalty for his part in this murder, and he is currently awaiting death on death row in the San Quentin State Prison in San Quentin, California. Jesse Ruggie, who was 20 years old at the time of the crime, was charged with aiding and abetting of kidnapping, and also the execution of Nicholas Markowitz. He was convicted of aggravated kidnapping for ransom or extortion with special circumstances in the year 2002, and he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after seven years. Parole was originally denied to him in 2006. However, when he was brought before the parole board again in the year 2013, he actually was granted parole. So he was let out on October 14th of 2013 after serving just 11 years in prison. William Skidmore, who was 20 years old at the time of the crime, was charged with kidnapping and robbery, and he was sentenced to nine years in a state prison. He actually took a plea bargain to avoid a much heavier sentence, and he was released from prison in April of 2009. Graham Presley, who was 17 at the time of the murder and who was the one responsible for digging Nicholas Markowitz's grave, was actually charged twice for his involvement in the crime. In July of 2002, he was acquitted of kidnapping and the jury was hung 8-4 to four in favor of not guilty for the murder charge. In October of 2002, however, he was retried and convicted of second-degree murder. Presley was incarcerated until 2007 when he was set free. Jesse James Hollywood, who was 20 when the murders happened, obviously got most of the penalty for this. Even though he was not present at the scene of the crime, he was the mastermind who orchestrated the whole thing, who orchestrated the kidnapping, who orchestrated the murder, and who was essentially at fault for all of this, even though he had little involvement in the actual crimes themselves. Right after the murder, Jesse James Hollywood went on the run. First, he escaped to Canada, and from Canada, he actually went down to Brazil. And he managed to invade law enforcement officers for five years while living in Brazil before he was actually caught. While living in Brazil, he had actually tried to get a woman pregnant so that he wouldn't be deported, but he wasn't very smart about how the immigration laws in Brazil worked because that actually did not guarantee him any sort of security whatsoever. And even if it did help him, he was there illegally because he was running away from a crime, so it wouldn't have granted him any sort of security anyways. He had been on the FBI's most wanted list for five years leading up to his capture in March of 2005. And in 2009, he was convicted of kidnapping and first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I do think it's kind of interesting that he did not get the death penalty, even though Ryan Hoyt did. I guess Ryan Hoyt was the one who pulled the trigger, but it seems to me that he got a more severe punishment than Jesse James Hollywood, which doesn't really seem fair, but when it comes to murder, what is fair, right? Now, in addition to criminal cases, there was also a civil court case where the Markowitz family won $11.2 million in 2003. They sued the kidnappers as well as the killers. They also sued the people whose houses the house parties were held at because none of them did anything to help Nicholas at all, as well as the family friend whose van was used to do the actual kidnapping of Nicholas Markowitz. Now, Susan Markowitz reportedly ended up in the hospital around 12 times following the murder of her son for various reasons. She struggled greatly with depression after this event, and it was really hard for her to recover from. She was quoted as saying when she wasn't in mental hospitals or trying to kill herself, she had one focus, and that was to find Jesse James Hollywood. Susan Markowitz went on to write a book called My Stolen Son, and that was all about her experiences going through this. It's reported that originally, when she couldn't get a hold of her son on that night, she knew that something was wrong, but she never could have imagined something like this is what happened. 
Now, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there is a movie called Alpha Dog that is loosely based on this. So if this is a story that's been interesting to you, I do urge you to look into that movie. It is very well made, very well done. I remember watching it and just thinking it was a really, really crazy story. And that is it for today's case. If you guys enjoyed this video, please make sure to give me a thumbs up so that I know you like content like this. And if you do enjoy true crime, conspiracy theory, missing people, that type of content, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and that bell notification as well. And until next time, I love you all very much and we'll touch base soon. Bye.